Outrocast. Good day for you so far, aside from having to talk to media folks. <laughs> I, I I love it. I love it. I uh, I had a little break where I did a voiceover. We had a uh, edited a new episode together, and I was talking about it with my director. And we put so much hard work into it. The truth of the matter is, all of it. The fact that anyone will allow us the opportunity to talk about this thing that was like this labor of love and so much fun and such a trip down memory lane is the best. So, no, no, yeah. man, I got a crow. Heard the, I heard the title and right away went, okay, we're watching this show. Was it always the title of the show as we see it now? Uh, yes, as far as I know. Uh, the, the, the title was, was uh, uh, the network had already conceived of the idea and I thought it was awesome. And I was, I mean, look, I was born in 1974. So I was six years old, you know, and you remember stuff when you're six pretty clearly. And, um, you know, it's the last decade before the internet and it's the decade where America saw this great economic growth with the shift to Reaganomics. So <laughs> everything that got really from deep. the, well, no, but you know what I'm saying? It yes. was big hair, big shoulder pads and loud colors and oh, MTV yeah. and, to be able to to look at that decade through the prism of something that I've kind of made part of my life's work with food, it's the it's the best. It's the damn best. And my guidance counselor didn't tell me this job was out there, and I'm so happy I found it. That's a really good point and a really strong thing that I like to talk about with people, that you're growing up and you think, this is my hobby, this is my passion, and then they go, you know, that's nice. So when you're a teacher, you can leave at 3.30 and then you could do that. I'm curious when exactly you figured out that you could just, now it is a lot of work what you do, but when you could have a fun oriented career. I didn't know you could. Uh, and I had a, a, a little bit of a hard time. Like I had this really good yeah. education and everything. And I think my family was a little bit like, and now what are we doing? Because I knew I was into performing arts, but I had gone uh, to college for something completely different. Yeah. And um, to be, I'll be honest with you, there was I read a few books, and I don't get any any kind of kickback, but I read a few books that in order that I say changed the trajectory of my life. Uh, the first one was called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And I was riding the subways in New York, like as an actor pounding the pavement, you're on the train yeah. all the time. So that one. And then my stepmom had bought herself this book and loaned it to me and I never gave it back called The Renaissance Soul by Margaret Lovenstein. And that may have been the single most influential one. The third one was called The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Hmm. Uh, but the the Renaissance Soul, the third title was called life design for people with too many passions to pick just one and what i loved about it was it wasn't like sort of floofy esoterica it was almost like a workbook and i i am dead ass 100 percent telling you bible truth there was an exercise like a reverse flow chart where you took your passions and your skills and it sort of helped you fine tune what your ideal or dream career would be and i'm not kidding you television food host was the thing and the premise is essentially that once you sort of figure out what values motivate you and where you're meant to be you just dedicate all your effort to doing that and so at that point i had a culinary resume and a performance. yeah why don't i just find a way to join them there's got to be a way to join them and that's what i did yeah <laughs> to you just described it very very well and the best and, and worst too thing long well, hey, I, I'm there too. I figured out how to make a living doing what I like to do. So it happens. But uh, when we were growing up again, it was always the what's the backup plan. Yet in 2022, I like sneakers. You know what? I'm going to talk about sneakers and I'm going to make a living making uh, videos about sneakers. It's true, but it wasn't true 20 years ago. Correct. Or even 10 years ago. So you're in this position and Adam eats the 80s. <laughs> Great show. Did you have any hesitation to having your name in the title? You know, uh, yes and no. Um, that's a great question. Um, Every now and then, I have one of those. Like, just I think you know. I, you, you, I would disagree. I think that that print love averages. You, you usually, you usually don't miss, my brother. Uh, but I, I, I would say. Uh, 
you know, it's never a matter of, of hubris. I think that the idea behind putting my name in the title, which was, again, that was the network's call, um, because we try to like add as much, like to imbue it all with as much of an element of a personal journey, as much as it is hosted by the guy you know from Man vs. Food, that it's much more about like, I live through this. Mm -hmm. like, I'll let you know my favorite flavors. You'll see my genuine reaction. If anyone's going to remember what Runt's candy should taste like or what a pudding pop should look like, it's your boy. Just your boy. And so, so that moment is, is, is real. And I feel that I'm glad that it's not my full name. Not that I, I'm not fiercely proud of being Adam Richmond, but rather. I think you should be. Thank you. But I, I think that it's, it's this most, this moment of like, we're all doing it. Like if I can do this to know that, yes, I'm the guy who gets to go to the food lab and have the food scientists recreate the original McDonald's French fry fried and beef. Sure. Program. I know that that's not something that the public can readily do, but by showing them how it's done, they can recreate it. You can unlock the secrets and we're all here for the journey. And if I don't approach it with the arrogance or hubris of a food scientist, which is not to say that a food scientist are arrogant or, 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 or prideful, but that is to say, I'm not one. So it would be pretentiousness on my part. I'm just a guy who got very lucky to make these shows. And so as a result, if I go, and these food scientists were genuinely the most lovely, brilliant people that let them be the scientists, let them talk about the high design, let me break it down for you. And then together we could be like, Coca-Cola was once made with sugar. It yeah. was a time when there was red FDNC red number five and all those things you can't have anymore. Mexican Coke, it anytime you go to the West Coast, that's what you want to get, or at least what I want to get. But but you know, this is a compliment. There's there's not gonna be a backhanded part to it. Um, what I really like about what you do is that you go lowbrow and you go highbrow. In other words, you can appreciate that original McDonald's fry, but then you also know a really good steak too. And I find that most of the people that everyone oh. widely loves only do in the food space, they only do the top tier upscale quote best, but you can go high and low in what you do. Have you always been that way? Or is it initially a like, I'm not going to show my guilty pleasures? So again, deep, deep. Deep compliment. Thank you. Uh, two, two for two. <laughs> hey, oh. <laughs> no, but th there was something in New York Magazine, and I remember it was very heady, or New York Courier. No, New, yeah. York, New York, New York, New York. If you're Courier. watching Inventing Anna, it's Manhattan Magazine. Oh, okay. Like okay. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, no, New York Courier was a lot more of the, the literature, but yeah. New York was a little bit more chic, and my mom subscribed to it, I remember. Yeah. And they had this matrix and it was highbrow to lowbrow, brilliant and despicable. And it was where certain things landed. And I loved, I loved the fact that there were things that be, could be considered lowbrow and brilliant. Mm -hmm. I was just studying Shakespeare and they talk about the groundlings, you know, the, the, the common folk and the jokes that were like thrown in for the work, the working people. And um, I, I feel, you know, my, my mom was a teacher. My, my pop passed when I was 23. So it wasn't like I came from like vast sums of wealth and stuff. And I was. Keep dead bay. Oh, I get it. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thank my, you. My, my family had a furniture store for like 50 years in, in Cheap Said Bay. So you have to respect that area. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. That's very cool to know that we share similar roots. So as such, you realize that everything is deserving of respect. And some of the greatest meals I've had have been like, you know, you get bread from this place on Avenue and you go to this Salumeria for sausage and peppers or for cold cuts, or yep. you go to this little hole in the wall in Chinatown or in, um, you know, uh, I don't know, a place in downtown Los Angeles or something like this. And you can find that um, ultimately, if you treat foods with respect and you appreciate the craftsmanship of them, uh, equally, then there should be room for all of us at the table, literally and figuratively, I suppose. And uh, I remember my father may rest in peace. Actually, picture my pop right here. Um, 
but his law office uh, for a while was in Chinatown. And I remember he had picked up a few clients that had restaurants and catering businesses. And I remember we went to a real dim sum parlor before that was like a thing you like did for brunch. And I remember th there was other chicken feet or congealed blood. Mm -hmm. And I had said, um, like, Ugh. my dad very sternly but calmly said, that's very rude. He said, what about foods that mommy makes? someone else might try that's not Jewish and say, yuck, would you like it if someone said that about gefilte fish or chocolate <laughs> or these other things that we that we grew up eating? He said, you don't have to finish it. You should at least try it and always try it, yeah. show respect. And that was the thing. And, and just try it. Just try it. You know, and if you're a guest in someone's home, someone's country, someone's restaurant, you, you have to you have to show deference you have to i mean this is their inventory like if you're even if you're filming a show and they're getting exposure that's no excuse to be anything less than respectful and appreciative in my opinion that's that's my well, honest well opinion. said are, are you that uh alternately highbrow lowbrow with other interests i'm guessing the answer is yes given your history with soccer which itself is highbrow lowbrow and everything well yeah i mean i yeah i i think that's kind of like a way to maintain a degree of youthfulness and here i am doing a show where like our main currency is nostalgia mm -hmm. but if i'm just a, a dude in his 40s talking about his childhood that's not a show that's going to really work because there's no immediacy. And so for people who don't have any personal connection with the decade of the 1980s, why on earth would they watch it? Right. So you have to be able to create kind of an infectious energy and create sort of a shared experience of either that joy and their nostalgia. So how do you, how, uh, someone who grew up playing like arcade level games on their phone, how do you get them to understand what the Rubik's Cube was or how it filled you with magic? Or the first time there was, you know, the, the, the NES with bot, the robot and, and playing Duck Hunt where you could shoot at your screen. Yeah. Knowing it was within the same decade as Pong and the Intellivision and ColecoVision. Right. And game, gamers now make millions of dollars. Like th this – this gap has to be filled. So you have to be kind of highbrow and lowbrow because on one level, I'd love to talk to the history buffs about, okay, Chicken McNuggets come out in 1983. Original Chicken Sandwich comes out, I think, in 81. 86 BK Chicken Tenders. Everyone's like, oh, all the chicken places, all the fast food are competing with chicken. But there's a reason. There's a historical reason. I, I don't know this, so please blow my mind with this one. I'm about to. So ranchers carried over massive amounts of debt from the 1970s into the 1980s. And as such, uh, they sold off huge swaths of their herd. So there's less cattle, beef costs more, mm -hmm. that's food pivots to chicken. That's the truth. So now you have this moment. You have Ronald Reagan passing laws that allows uh, that advertising agencies and brands could market directly to children. That was not allowed before the 1980s. And with the spread of television, the advent of cable television, Americans were watching closer to eight hours of TV than ever before. And also remember, there was a finite amount of media consumption. You can go to the movies, you can listen to the radio, or you could watch right. channels one through 13. And that's it. That's it. That's it, dude. That's right. all you got. With, Maybe with UHF. You didn't even have that rectangular box with, that was wired. That didn't even happen yet. And and also, there's nothing on Channel 6 unless you paid for HBO. Like, <laughs> there was no zero or one. I remember watching like UHF channels and stuff. At the end of the day, though, when you realize, um, being that it's the last decade before the internet, right, that yeah. the, the, the bleed through of ideas happened like we all consume the same media yeah. you you could be fans of hugely popular shows that i haven't seen simply because they're on hulu and i watch netflix yeah that there could be but back then we all watched the same movies saw the same shows had the same cultural references we quoted the same commercials commercials entered like jingles and slogans entered the zeitgeist because there was 
just that much media to consume. It wasn't like it is now. Yeah. And so that's why we can all quote, you know, like a, a Spuds McKenzie commercial or a, 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 like a, beef and yeah. But, Frankie hey. say, relax, don't do it. But I took you way off course there. So, okay. So, so going back Reaganomics, uh, beef was too expensive. So they, they transitioned to chicken because it's expensive. Correct. And then, uh, and then again, it, if you look at the early stuff, like that original BK chicken sandwich and even the chicken McNugget, yeah, it's not cutlets. It's not the fancy buttermilk dip cutlet we got now. It's not the uh, crispy kernel. It's processed and formed. Chicken McNuggets, I found out during the making of Adam Eats the 80s, have four official shapes. Bell, ball, bone, and boot. And it is meant... Uh, to ensure even cooking time and distribution wow. of ingredients because everybody knows the tastiest part of the chicken it is always the boot <laughs> are you more of a wing guy or a, a wing guy or a breast guy you I like the boot big fan I, of the boot i'm i'm with you there you had me at boot so so it was cost and efficiency but that to the fast food revolution towards chicken Correct. And I think like to, to bring it all the way back to highbrow, lowbrow, it's simply that this, that if I could talk to you about in equal measure, the, how funny it is that Chicken McNuggets have this designation and it's reformed chicken that's then fried, whatever, and then talk to you about the historical conditions that create it. And I put them both on an equal plane of importance and respect. Mm -hmm. Then what happens is you can appeal to a broader range, in my opinion, appeal to a broader range of people because you're not talking down to anybody. You're treating, I like a good fart joke, but I also can appreciate a weird historical joke. Like that's, it's, it's stupid and it's prurient and whatever you want to call it. But I think that there has to be, there has to be that moment where the history lesson has to end and then you're just excited you get to try a can of new coke again yeah new coke well i, I have a a quick question and then one topic and then this man is free and the first one no, comes from a coming, big fan of yours named dante capizzolo and he wanted to know i do wonder if there's anything he actually regrets eating now, I think that's in reference to just all the food challenges, but a lot of people over the years going, uh, hey, eat this. <laughs> and you, you've always been very open and willing to try things. So is there like a quick, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have had that. Yes. I'll let, did you notice he said quick because I won't shut the hell up. I do ramble and I apologize. No, 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 no. Quite the opposite. I, I, um, Respectful of your time. I'll, 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 I'll have you know that there were two things during the course of Adam Eats the 80s. So we were trying to hunt down authentic 80s foods. And in some cases, we found them in closed packages. Um, and maybe it's morbid curiosity. Maybe it's a desire that to, to be morbid and, and eventually die. I don't know. But um, uh, we found it was two, there were two items during the course of this show. One was a 41-year-old. Pepperidge Farm Star Wars cookie. It was from 1983. And one was, I believe, a 38-year-old juice box of high C ecto cooler. Oh. And uh so the ecto cooler, to start with that one, like that look that looked like a bad idea. It's 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 just it's so it's so stupid. It's like one of those internet clips. Like, what made you think you could jump off the roof and land? What what made you think that? And it had separated, and I think it had eaten away at the metallic container of the juice box. And uh, bless his heart, the the man who who it was our Ghostbusters episode, and the man whose Ghostbusters uh, memorabilia collection it was ran off screen and, and ectoplasmed twice, and. Uh, and, it, and I have this terrible pain in my ears, the back of my jaw. So that's one. And two was the Star Wars cookie, which I actually ate. <laughs> we filmed on Yom Kippur. And the first, the first thing I ate after fasting 
was a cookie with 41 year old butter and eggs and yep. my stomach audibly made like a Chewbacca noise on camera. And we have footage where my camera guy's laughing so much, he had to put the uh, the camera on the tripod because you literally heard like, oh, like from my stomach. Like my stomach was like, this? You atone for your sins and you this, this is what you give me? Wow. Uh, well, Totally different topic here. Everyone thinks of you as the food guy. Some people who dig a bit know about the minority ownership of a soccer team, football, if you're European. Just a stockholder, just a stockholder and a a sponsor of another one. But a minority owner, I wish. And we also hear about, hey, that guy, you know, went to Yale drama school and he's a real deal actor. But I was really intrigued by a tweet of yours from October 2020 when Eddie Van Halen passed and you had a great tribute that people did not really go into depth about. So I was wondering, huge Van Halen fan, A, and B, was that because David Lee Roth is Jewish? Wow, could you remind me of the tweet? Uh, You said, this man was a huge inspiration to me and countless other young guitarists, absolutely awful loss. My condolences to his entire family. So um, I had started playing guitar uh, my, my father played me rest in peace my dad played guitar and um he got me into it i played when i was younger he got me lessons with this guy uh who played in the brooklyn philharmonic who was the music teacher at my school who was just so mean and like sucked the joy out of it and it wasn't until high school that i picked it up again when <clears throat> my a got really back into listening to music and listening to my dad's old vinyl and my stepmom's vinyl my mom's and so on and you know my my babysitter had introduced me to like what like one babysitter was really into like zappa and into captain beefheart and into um like the the dictators the ramones and and someone else was in names that you have just said shows me you are a bigger music fan than we realize oh yeah and then i had the dictators and beefheart right well then yeah and then another one like super into like sticks and REO Speedwagon and yes and um foreigner and another kind of vibe and my cousins you know they're like Long Island so there was like a lot of like Billy Joel and Danny Gans and, uh, yeah. and anyway um <laughs> yes so like I had like I was decently uh decently into uh music and I also saw that the guys who play guitar in high school got all the girls. And I was like, hey, that's cool. Uh, or, or at least were like appealing. There was an appeal. Yeah. And um, I got a Strat. I got uh, some a sand Fender Strat. I got a Strat with a PV Rage amp, a little tiny 40 watt PV Rage amp, which is actually sitting right to my right, right here. It's like a 20 watt little amp. 40 watt, 40 watt oh. little amp. And uh, with a super sat channel. And I have all my guitars like right over, right over here. And, um, but yeah, I, I guess for me, um, Eddie Van Halen, not just like hammering on and tapping and stuff like that, but what he was doing, there was just this kind of exuberance and the mm-hmm. paint job on that red Kramer guitar yeah, and everything about it. Like there were like those, I, I got really down the rabbit hole with guitar stuff and, Steve Vai and Balkenberg and big Joe, wow. big, big Joe Satriani fan. And uh, I remember, oh God, breaking my fat sausage fingers, trying to play D by Randy Rhodes. And wow, um, really just, there were like those guitar titans, you know, Mark Knopfler from Dire Straits and, uh, you know, guys that were sort of these, Kirk Hammett from Metallica, I remember being obsessed with his style uh, for a little while, really just being into like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Hamilton, not Tom Hamilton, from what's his name? The, the Brad, is it Brad Whitford? Brad the, Whitford the, and Tom Hamilton from Aerosmith. From Aerosmith, yeah, yeah, the rhythm guitarist. Yeah, I, and so um, I, I'm so far down the rabbit hole with this fucking music story. Well, I know who Adrian Vandenberg, Vandenberg is. So this this is not too down the rabbit hole. This is everyday conversation. I'm just amazed you didn't say Ingve. 
Uh, I almost said Ingvi Malmsteen. <laughs> oh my God, I almost did. And then I was like, stop, stop. Like I was like, don't do that. Because like at that point, you know what I mean? Like, because then these are the, the conversations I have when I was like, yeah, like Dookie's good, but do you remember when Green Day was on Lookout Records and they were like, Wow, out? you just said Lookout Records. So, therefore, you know, Operation Ivy. I was about to just say I had an Operation Ivy jacket that I handmade. And the band that I was in, freshman year of college, we used to cover Sound System and we used to cover Unity. I am not playing around with you. There's a wall going down between my brothers and I. I don't want no wall going down, going down tonight. Not every day that you speak to somebody who's aware who Steve Vai is and appreciates that, and also Op Ivy. Yes. So I <laughs> thank you. Thank you for saying that. So that's the truth. I, I guess for me, because music was so big, it was a language with my father and I. Yeah. It was a bit, a little bit of a path to confidence, a little bit of a path to maybe identity that um he was just one of those people that um you know i've never been this slender slinky snake-hipped rock god like a joe perry or a slash you know what i'm saying and so the guys that maybe were a little bit wild a little bit more technical a little bit more oddballish the angus youngs whatever that always sort of appealed to me mm-hmm. um and i love the way slash played you know and plays you know, but there were those guys in Eddie Van Halen, whether he was, I just, it just looked like, like he was on work release. Like he had just gotten out, like this reckless abandon. And then he was able to like, I'm not just talking about stuff like eruption, but like, like Panama. Panama is incredible because not everyone realizes that was written as like an homage to ACDC. It was supposed to sound like an ACDC riff. I had that I did not know. I didn't know at all, quite frankly. And the next time uh, you hear the chorus, listen to it and you go, makes like, sense. ACDC. Oh my God. Totally. Yeah. From, from from Thunderstruck to Panama, like that refrain, that like arena chant refrain makes complete sense. And I and I guess for me, right, like it's of the era. They have this seminal album, nineteen eighty four. And it's like the idea that I lived in a year where like Michael Jackson releases that Prince is releasing Purple Rain and 1984. It's almost too much to bear. Like, can the culture handle th- that much zeitgeist at once? And then, like, in between, like Duran Duran sprinkles in Seven and the Ragged Tiger, and you know what I'm saying? And then Run DMC, Tougher Than Leather, and License to Ill, and you're going like, so many different directions i mean then again i'm the kid who went to yeshiva with like learning how to write the iron maiden and van halen flying vh logo on my loose leaf and the rabbis had issues with like iron maiden (laughs) wow so it wasn't uh david lee roth that hooked you in it was eddie van halen for van halen it was it was the music man it wasn't like anyone in particular Although I do laugh that one of the most wonderful chefs from Gramercy Tavern in New York is named Michael Anthony. And I, <laughs> I low-key hoped it was like the bassist who had just sort of been like, you know what? They didn't give me that snifter of all green M&Ms as was in my rider. So no. I, uh, he's a brilliant chef. But I, I don't know. It was the music. It was specifically the album 1984 and further cemented by that claymation sequence in the movie Better Off Dead. Another 80s uh, classic. That's the best part, by the way, of doing this. There's a place in Fort Collins, Colorado called Totally 80s Pizza. Oh. And it's, it's a shrine to the decade. And this guy has curated one of the mo- single most impressive collections ever. Like you will walk around going, I had that. I wanted that. I needed that. I Bananas. <laughs> well, I look forward to going there the next time I'm in Fort Collins, Colorado. I can't thank you enough for your time and really all the great work that you do, you've done, and you have coming up, Adam. That's very thoughtful of you to say. Thank you for all the time, the great questions, and just getting a chance to talk about a show that I love. And I just, can I just say one thing? Like, it's not just about like looking back at the decade through the prism of food, but straight up, 
like we'll get to the straight origin story for these like 80s foods that became these national and global icons and getting to recreate and resurrect the ones that you thought were gone like og mcdonald's french fries fried in the beef tallow coca-cola when it was made out of sugar bonkers candy keebler's magic middles we go to food lab like i couldn't do it i couldn't do it we go to people way smarter than me but I look so forward good. to also the spinoffs because let's face it, when you have a name like Adam Eats the 80s, Adam Rocks the 80s, uh, etc., cetera, it, it just prints itself. Or Adam Eats the 70s, or Adam Eats the 90s, right? Sky's the limit, man. I can't wait to come back with my tribal armband talking about Slip Cannot and, <laughs> and Creed. <laughs> I see what you did there. And man, Thank Corey you. Taylor is a nice gentleman. But uh, what can you do? <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Have a great one. All the best. All the best. Okay. Take care, sir. Bye-bye. Outrocast.